Hello and welcome to this week's lecture. I hope everybody had a good spring break. If you did anything interesting, let me know and I'd love to hear what you did, where you went, who you saw, and that you had some fun. Uh, for this week, we're going to talk about a topic called imperialism and specifically imperialism of the 1800s, 19th century. And Europe in the 19th century really begins to spread its control over Africa and Asia as well. In the last third of the 19th century, Europe spreads its power to control over 10 million square miles of land and over 150 million people. That's about a fifth of the entire world's land and about 10% of its population. This new colonization, by the way, it's based on the idea of industrialization, uh, lowering costs, raising production, and using Western industrial methods and Western scientific methods to do it. There are several reasons for this new imperialism. One of these reasons is this need for raw materials and new markets. New raw materials like oil and rubber, copper, tin, other rare metals are needed. And then they need a place to not only source those materials from, but a place to sell those materials to. There's also this need for control. They want to control the source of the raw materials through complete political control. They want to have physical control over the raw materials, not just market control. Modernized medicine is going to play a big part in this because there are new immunizations against typhoid. There's a method to rehydrate you if you catch cholera. There's Ipecac for dysentery. Now, Tropical diseases and protozoa, meaning animal-based or, or biological-based illnesses, those still do remain an issue. But diseases caused by bacteria and viruses, they are beginning to create immunizations against. There's also the idea of national prestige. Uh, colonization drove a lot of excitement and a lot of nationalism in the home country. There was also this illusion or delusion, if you will, of spreading civilization. In my U.S. history classes this week, we're talking about manifest destiny, the idea of uh, civilizing the American West. Uh, you find that same idea in parts of Argentina, the white man's burden in India, and multiple other places as well. There's also a diversion from class conflict. If one country is having a problem with a subset of its people, you can say, hey, look over there, everybody looks, and you forget about the class conflict. Or, hey, we just took this gigantic territory, it's ours now, yay, go us. I love political cartoons. If you've never been somebody to look at political cartoons, I highly suggest you do it because you can learn a lot about the, the atmosphere, if you will. So I have two political cartoons here. On the left, you can see the Russians, the British, and the Germans kind of handpicking and putting pieces of the globe into their little grab bags. It was almost seen as a free-for-all where you could just take what you want. And then on the right, this is supposed to be an octopus, if you will, that is representing England. And you can see England is slowly taking over more and more of the world and even strangling parts of it. So let's start with British India. In the year 1600, Queen Elizabeth I chartered the English East India Trading Company. Its sole purpose was to compete with the Dutch in the spice trade. 
they were completely unable to keep up. The Dutch were much better traders than the English ever were. And instead of trying to trade all over the East Indias, East Indies, I should say, the East India Company decided to turn all of their attention to India itself. Now, the English East India Company is going to gain exclusive trading rights in the cities of Madras, Bombay, and Calcutta. And by 1647, the English East India Trading Company is going to have about 25, I think it's actually 27 trading posts along the coast of India. The English are not the only ones there. There are a couple of French ports. There are, I think, two Portuguese ports. But the English, by far, are going to have the most trading posts and the most influence in the Indian subcontinent. Now, when the Mughal Empire collapses in the early 1700s, and we've already talked about that in a previous video, uh, fighting broke out between the Muslim forces and the Hindus for control of what was left. And when the Mughal Empire falls apart, the countries of Great Britain and France are going to get involved. Great Britain is going to support the Hindus. France is going to support the Muslims. In 1751, a British force led by a guy named Robert Clive, and Robert Clive, by the way, is an employee of the English East India Trading Company. He's not a member of the English government. He's not a member of the English army, but Robert Clive is a secretary with the English East India Company. So in 1751, this British force, I should say this, East India Trading Company force led by Robert Clive is going to defeat a combined Muslim French force near the city of Madras and when Robert Clive and his group defeat the Muslim French forces the English East India Company is going to gain control over the region now this would be like if Microsoft or Twitter or even Apple had its own private military and took over parts of the world. Now fighting begins five years later as part of the Seven Years War. If you've had American history you've probably studied the French and Indian War or the the Seven Years War there. And what a lot of people don't know and what I always stress in my courses is that the Seven Years War was a global war. Fighting happened in North America. Fighting happened in Central America. Fighting happens in England, in Europe, in Africa, and in India. So during the Seven Years' War, a French-supported Muslim prince is going to capture the city of Calcutta. And when this Muslim prince captures the city of Calcutta, 146 British civilians are going to be held overnight in a dungeon that's basically the size of a large bedroom. It only had one window. So imagine your bedroom, 146 civilians in there with you and very, very little air. By morning, all but 23 of the prisoners die because of suffocation and just there's nowhere to breathe. In response to this, uh, this becomes known as the Black Hole of Calcutta, and Robert Clive is going to lead a force of 3,000 British and Indian troops, and the Indian troops are known as Sepoys. So Clive leads a force of 3,000 British and Sepoys to recapture Calcutta. After they retake Calcutta, they then defeat an army of 50,000 at the Battle of Plassey. Now, as part of the Treaty of Paris, 1763, France gives up all of their claims to territory in Canada and North America, 
but they also give up all their claims to territory in India. Robert Clive, by the way, following the Treaty of Paris, 1763, Robert Clive is going to end up becoming the governor of Calcutta. So he is a secretary for the East India Trading Company. He's going to go on to become the governor of the colony that's run by the East India Company. Now, Robert Clive, as a company man, his primary goal is to end illegal profits being made by company workers who are selling goods on the black market. Uh, company workers were selling food supplies to Indians at prices so high they couldn't pay and often died of starvation. But if you did find somebody who could pay or if they were desperate enough to pay, you can make huge profits. So for about 10 years, India is going to be run by the East India Trading Company as its own private colony without the English or British government stepping in at all. It's not until 1773 that the British Parliament passes something known as the Regulation Act, and that gave the East India Company money in exchange for some oversight in India. Not control, just oversight. Basically, in 1773, the British Parliament could slap the East India Company and Robert Clive on the hands and say, don't do that, that's bad but no actual regulatory control. It's not until 1784 with the India Act does the government of Great Britain actually have a say in what's going on in India. Prior to this, the East India Company ran its own government inside the British government and the East India Trading Company uh, they had their own country. But the India Act of 1784 takes away a lot of that power and really puts India under control of the British government for the first time. As the first Governor General, Lord Cornwallis, yes, the same Lord Cornwallis who was involved in the American Revolution, after his failure to maintain the American colonies, he lands as the governor general in India. And some would say that's actually an upgrade. Now, after Lord Cornwallis has named the first governor general, he sets up a British style court system, a British style civil service, and he really tries to model the colony government after the British government. Now, only a few educated Indians are going to be allowed to pass the civil service tests, and only a select few educated Indian natives are going to enter the civil service. It's very much going to be run by government officials from, from um, Britain. Now, in 1795, Lord Cornwallis will be replaced by a guy named Richard Wellesley. Richard Wellesley, it's a name I'm probably not going to put on the final exam, but I do think it's important to know that under Wellesley, British land holdings doubled. Wellesley started to find ways to steal money and steal land away from the local population. Underneath Richard Wellesley, the British government begins to rewrite Indian customs. A British style education system is brought in. The, the um, I guess it would be tradition of sati is abolished. And in sati, it was tradition that a widow threw herself on her husband's funeral fire so she would die and burn with her husband. The British are going to outlaw that. The British are going to weaken and eventually outlaw the caste system. And it made it legal for widows to remarry because in traditional Indian culture, widows did not marry 
primarily because they very often threw themselves on the fire that was burning their husband. Now we come to something called the Sepoy Rebellion. I remember Sepoy is an Indian soldier working in the British Army. Well, in the year 1857, the British are going to introduce to their army something known as the Enfield Rifle. The Enfield Rifle required the soldiers to bite the top off of a greased packet known as a cartridge. And in the greased package would be the gun powder and the buckshot and all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. And they would bite the top off of this greased cartridge. They would pour the contents into the end of the gun. They would pack down the, the gunpowder and everything, and then they would shoot the gun. Well, a rumor started that the cartridges were smeared with both beef and pork fat. Now, beef was seen as holy to Hindus, pork, was seen as unholy to Muslims, and they were both Muslims and Hindus in the Sepoy army. As a result, the Sepoy soldiers are going to refuse to load their rifles because of the grease. The Sepoy soldiers are going to be seen as rebelling against their officers some of these Sepoy soldiers will be dismissed from the army completely. Others will be sent to prison. Now, in reality, the greased cartridge had neither pork or beef grease, but hysteria goes a long way. Now, on May 10th, 1857, three divisions of the Sepoy army located near Delhi are going to revolt against the British. They free all the Sepoy villagers and prisoners and soldiers and everybody else who was in jail. They march to the city of Delhi and they attempt to install a new Mughal emperor. Which remember, Mughal is a Muslim prince that rules over the Hindus. Near the city of Lucknow, a group of 400 British men, women, and children, they're promised safe passage out of the city, but in reality, they're going to be surrounded and massacred by the Sepoy army. Out of the 400 British men, women, and children, it's said that only four of them survived. This rebellion is going to spread throughout northern India. And it's going to take the British over a year to bring it to an end. Now, India, after the year 1858, it's going to change. In 1858, the British Parliament passes something known as an Act for the Better Government of India. And in 1858, the British Parliament and the British government, they're going to try and treat the people of India more like equals. Um, for example, the British East India Company is completely abolished. Any and all parts of ruling the colony are given to the government of Great Britain, so the East India Company is completely out of the picture. The Governor General is replaced by a Viceroy. Um, that's a more senior official and the only person the Viceroy answered to was the Secretary of State and Parliament. Parliament also began to return land stolen under Wellesley to local ownership, but if there were no longer any living heirs, if there was not somebody who they could give the land to that was related to the original owners, then the British government kept it. There were 550 or 560 different little states and principalities within India. All of these 550 or 560 local states, local principalities, were technically controlled by a local prince, but all treaties, 
all foreign affairs were the responsibility of the British government and the Viceroy could appoint and replace princes whenever they wanted to. So these are independent princes who are not actually independent and have to listen to what the British government says. There are Western inventions brought to India, such as the railroad, the telegraph, those are brought in. A British style postal service is brought in. And even British style schools and universities are built in India. Because of these British style schools, it becomes a social status and an education status to be able to teach and speak English. So that drives the growth of the English language. Ironically, the ones doing the, the studies in these Indian universities, they're going to read information by Enlightenment philosophers and they're going to go on to lead the nationalist and independence movement that will strike in India about 50 years later. Now, the second topic is the scramble for Africa. Now, in 1875, Europe controlled less than 10% of African land. But by 1900, this is going to go all the way up to 90%. There are only two places in all of Africa that can be seen as independent by 1900. One of those is Liberia, which is this little uh, light blue mark right here. The other place that is independent is this large yellow area known as Ethiopia. Other than that, every single square acre of land in Africa was taken by a European power. Africa was seen as this economic gold mine. Uh, it had rare metals, it had scarce minerals, it had diamonds, it had rubber, it had coffee, everything that Europe needed to fuel their industrialization, they felt they could find in Africa. The Berlin Conference of 1884 and the general act of the Berlin Conference that signed afterwards is really the beginning of the scramble for Africa. And what there's a lot of significant things in this. But I would say the most significant part of the General Act of Berlin uh, was the fact that the document stated that a European power could acquire rights over colonial lands only if they had effective occupation. Blah. Effective occupation. This meant it wasn't enough to just to plant your flag and say, this is mine and go home. Underneath the Berlin Conference paperwork, you had to actually establish a government, fly your flag, create treaties with local government, and rule the area. To make it even easier to understand these European powers, they had to actually go to their colonies and stay there and stay active. As a result of this, random lines are drawn on maps of Africa to divide up the continent, regardless of friends, enemies, neighbors, tribes, ethnic groups, whatever. At this haphazard drawing up of random borders in the sand is going to have a lot of problems in the future. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you name it. There are still a lot of different ethnic groups fighting each other, fighting for independence, you name it, within Africa as a result of this General Act of Berlin Conference from 1884. In many cases, administrators from either Syria or India were brought in to run the economies of these colonies. They replaced most of the African administrators and very few if any people who were native to Africa 
are going to become leaders or even participants in these colonial governments. African people throughout the continent are going to be subdued by force. In German Southwest Africa, you have the Herrera Wars. You have the Army of Belgium and the, the government of Belgium creating atrocities in the Belgian Congo. The English and the Zulu are going to go to war with each other in the Zulu Wars of Africa. And then up in Egypt and the Sudan, you've got the Mahdi and the Mahdist Wars happening. Much of the warfare and trouble Africa has experienced really since 1884 it's all directly related in one way or another to this scramble for Africa. Also have to mention Japanese imperialism. This is a thing here too. Now in 1894, Japan was already a Western style powerhouse. It wanted its own empire. It wanted to be seen as equal to the West. Now to do this, they go to war with China. In 1894, China and Japan go to war and they take control of Korea. Now, how bad was this war for China? Well, the Chinese, uh, they fail to win a single victory during this first Rus or Sino-Japanese war. Now, after the victory over China, Japan is going to be seen as a true equal to the West, as a true ally to the West, and Britain is going to become very close friends with Japan because they think it's a way to keep the idea of Russian expansion in check. Because Japan and Britain become friends, Russia and France will become best friends and that will have a very big effect on world history in a few short decades. Now in 1904, Japan and Russia are going to go to war over control of Manchuria, which is part of China. And here this little Russo-Japanese war picture or image, Manchuria is this dark color right here. And that's where the Russo-Japanese War is going to get its start. Now Russia had just completed the Trans-Siberian Railroad and they had just built the naval base at Port Arthur. And because it had a naval base at Port Archer and because it felt it needed to protect the Trans-Siberian Railroad, they are going to want full control over Manchuria. Now Japan was actually okay with giving Manchuria over to the Russians if the Russians would agree to leave Korea alone. R the Russian Tsar refused to do this and refused to give Japan any agreements. And really, Russia didn't leave Korea alone because they thought Japan was still weak and still backwards. Well, on February 8th, 1904, the Japanese are going to attack the Russian forces completely without warning. The entire Russian Pacific fleet is going to be destroyed in less than 36 hours. The Japanese then attack Port Arthur about 20,000 soldiers die there, but Japan will ultimately win the battle. And then the Russian army is going to be destroyed at the, the Battle of Mukden, which is up into Manchuria. With the destruction of his army and his navy, uh, the leader of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II, is going to order that the Atlantic military unit, the Atlantic Navy, if you will, redeploy to Japan. Now when this Atlantic fleet gets to Japan, it's destroyed. 
Uh, on May 10th, 1905, Russia lost 12,000 sailors. 6,000 sailors are taken captive. <coughs> Excuse me. And 40 out of their 42 ships are destroyed. Japan, by the way, only loses 117 men and three boats. After defeating both Russia and China, Japan is going to be seen as a true equal to the West. It's going to be left completely alone to build an empire, and it's not going to be challenged again until the 1930s and the coming of World War II. Now, there's a lot more on imperialism out there to learn, but I am just, I'm limited by time. Um, but what's the overall result of this imperialism? Well, first of all, it's very hard to view objectively because of the subsequent warfare, the subsequent hardships, and all the trauma it did to create a period of peace in both Africa and India. Uh, since colonialization stopped, many places in Africa have erupted into uncontrolled violence. Europeans expropriated and used for their own purposes, both land and materials. Also, more often than not, European countries failed to train their indigenous people to govern themselves or what to do when the European powers left. In, I believe, yes, in the Congo, after World War II, the, the Belgian army basically says, hey, we're leaving next week, and they left a day early, and there was just such a power vacuum that almost as soon as the Belgians left the Congo, there was a civil war that broke out. So imperialism had a lot of effects that you know really messed up lives then, and in some ways still mess up lives today. I'm gonna pull the syllabus in here for just a moment because I wanna make sure you see where we are and what we're doing. This week is chapter 27, New Imperialism in the 19th Century. There are two readings for this week. Both of them are about the general defense of Berlin Act. And you also have to do the discussion number 12 and chapter 27 quiz. I also want you to notice there are a couple more assignments left. For next week, you're going to be expected to do the, the plunging of, um, oh, how do I want to put this? You're going to have to like plunge yourself into the end of the semester because we've got a reflection paper due, a museum review due, you got your SLO essay due, and by the way, I'm going to put out a video tomorrow about the SLO essay uh, so that you can get some information on that. Uh, your discussion 12 is due this week, chapter 27 quiz is due this week. There's a lot of stuff to do in the last three weeks, so I just want to encourage you and beg you, please don't be a stranger. I want to make sure that you finish the semester strong and that you do a lot of good work here at the end because there's a lot of points left at the end of the semester. The reflection paper is 5% of your grade. The museum review is 10% of your grade. The essay is 10% of your grade. That's 25% right there. And then the final is 20%. You got almost half of your, your grade here in the last bit of the class so finish strong don't be afraid to ask for help asking for help is not a sign of weakness especially when we all know after spring break classes get harder i was a college student for a long long time i know how it goes this is crunch time so if there's anything i can do to help you please let me know all right so once again watch this video thank you for watching it Start working on these end of course things and make sure you do watch the video I put out about the SLO because it's going to help you. Until next time, we'll see you later. I appreciate you. Bye.